there, folks. Welcome to my introduction to the Great Battles of the American Revolution series. I'm going to go into the rules and show you how the game system works, how it plays, hopefully, so you can follow along in my future battle vlog reports. Uh, I do plan to do Brandywine from this series, and hopefully this introduction to the rules will kind of help you understand how the game works and how the rules are applied. Now, I will be covering the specifics and the details of the particular uh, set of rules for Brandywine as I get into that game. But what I want to cover in this is just an introduction, a brief introduction to the actual rules themselves for the series. And hopefully you can refer back to this as you watch some of my battle vlog episodes. And as I mentioned, I will be doing Brandywine in my battle vlog. So refer back to this video and you'll get a greater understanding of the flow of play and how it really works. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into the rules. I'm going to show you the map layout and how it works, how the counters uh, play out, the stats on those counters, uh, how you stack, how you resolve combats, just a basic overview of the game play mechanics. So let's jump into the video and we'll start off by looking at the counters. Now let's visit Roundelay Hill here. Brandywine Battlefield. I'm going to take a look at some of these counters. Now, the units on the left are known as combat units uh, in the series rules. Uh, to the right, we have leaders and we have some uh, rifle arm troops, which I'll get into in a second. We also have various markers, which are used to remind us of certain things and functions in the rules. I'll get to them as well. Uh, till then, let's focus on the left sided counters. Uh, these are all your combat units, what they look like. Uh, on the counters. Uh, typically the green are Germans and Hessians, the ones aligned to the British cause, and the red are the British. Uh, and also the blue are typically your patriots and colonial troops. Uh, there's artillery, there is infantry, and there is cavalry, or your mounted troops, dragoons and that such, uh, as signified by the symbol or the illustration on the counters. Uh, kneeling uh, illustrations typically represent militia troops, uh, at least for the colonial side. Let's take a look at the values that we're going to be encountering on the actual counters. Of course, at the top, we have the name of the units. And again, this is a regimental or battalion, really, uh, sized game where each counter represents typically a regiment. Uh, we look at the artillery first. At the very top here, we see a value. Now, this is above the two numbers below it, right in the middle, right in front of the cannon barrel. And we also see this on infantry and the cavalry as well. This is the morale of the unit, the morale DRM or die roll modifier. This is a number that will be added to your die roll when you do things like rally or otherwise take any kind of morale check. Uh, so the higher, the better. Sometimes these values are shown in negative or they can be zero. Uh, not as good as the plus ones. As you can see, the British all along here have plus ones. Uh, so you're going to see this value on your combat units. We've got some Pennsylvania militia here. Uh, they're at a negative one. So, and the cavalry here are zero. Germans up here, we see a plus one and another plus one. And again, this is important. This is a leadership DRM. Below that are the most commonly used values in the game. You're going to start off on the left here with the strength points of the unit. Now, this is used a lot uh, when it comes to resolving combat. In the case of this artillery unit, it's a two. Uh, these infantry here are a nice solid five. Over here, the dragoons, they have a one. Uh, for the Americans, it's a six for the Pennsylvania militia, and their dragoons are a one. Uh, so that value is the strength points. It'll be used extensively in combat and also stacking. Now, each strength point represents uh, 100 men. Uh, so, for example, this unit of British infantry with five would represent 500 soldiers. Uh, now, when it comes to artillery, instead of it representing a number of men, it represents a number of guns. In this case, two guns per strength point. So this battery here actually represents uh, four cannon with a value of two. So that's what strength points represent. Again, they'll be used extensively when it comes to stacking uh, and in combat. Normally, you're maxed at six strength points uh, with or without up to one cannon counter per hex. 
Next, we have the movement value. Now, next to this cannon here, uh, we have a three. That is their movement points, the number of points they have to spend moving into and out of hexes. And based on the terrain type and the unit actually making the move, it will cost a certain number of movement points uh, for that unit to be able to enter a specific hex. Uh, this unit of infantry, uh, Fraser's Highlanders, actually, is four. So they have four movement points available for the turn. This cavalry has a six, which is typical for cavalry. As you can see, the colonials also have a six. Okay, so that's the basics of combat units. Another thing to look at is some of these units, quite a few actually, have a reverse side. And this is what is known as a two-step unit. In other words, it has two sides. If it only has one side, it's a single step unit. And steps are used to show losses in manpower and fighting efficiency. Whenever a unit takes a step loss, you simply flip the counter over to its reverse side. And you have basically, typically, you will have different values, lower values, for leadership as well as strength points. Movement, of course, will stay the same but it's usually a weaker, less efficient uh, side when you flip them. Not all units are two-step or two-sided like this. Some of them are, are single-sided, in which case when, they're, when they take a step loss, if they don't have a backup uh, reverse side, they are removed as eliminated. So there you go, folks. That is the basics of the combat units. Now let's take a look at the other types of counters. Before we start looking at the leader counters, uh, there is a couple other unit types, combat units that I should mention, and that is rifle armed units. And they are indicated by this little R uh, next to the unit illustration. In some cases, they'll have an LT, although not all rifle armed units are light infantry. Uh, but the LT does stand for light infantry, and that distinction will, will be important in the game sessions. Uh, otherwise, the R represents rifle-armed troops. In other words, they're able to shoot uh, in the game, much like artillery, except the range is only one hex. Artillery normally is three hexes. Uh, but anyway, there is an R symbol indicating rifle-armed units. They're able to shoot their rifles at the enemy. Uh, there's two different types. There are those with a white background in the circle and those with black background in the circle. Now, these guys, uh, when they engage in close combat, they're at a disadvantage, and that's what the black circle represents. So that's important to note, and a really important distinction amongst riflemen. Now, the white background troops don't suffer a penalty in close combat. And there's various reasons for that historically, but there is a distinction. Uh, there is another type of unit not shown here, and that is the unit types that have both muskets and rifles mixed into the same body of troops. Uh, and they're usually indicated by two separate com strength uh, points, uh, strength scores, actually. Uh, for instance, they might have a one for rifle and a three for uh, close combat. So this first number will actually have two values. Their strength points will have two separate values. Uh, otherwise, that is uh, the, the combat units for rifle-armed troops. Now let's take a look at the leaders. Now, these two leaders here, we have the British commander Grant and Sullivan for the Colonials. The first thing you want to pay attention to, besides the name of the commander, uh, is that they have a ranking along the right. It's a number of stars. The more stars they have, the higher up the chain of command they have. Uh, also below are the important values. Now, if we look at Sullivan here, he has a 0, dash 2, dash 6. Now, the first number applies to close combat DRMs. It, they're basically leadership modifiers, but this is his close combat DRM. This will modify uh, the combat results or units involved in the combat from his side that he is with or adjacent to, and otherwise influencing. In this case, Sullivan has a zero. He doesn't really uh, do much in to influence an actual outcome in combat. 
The second number, the two in this case, represents his leadership DRM. That's used for morale checks and uh, to rally attempts to help troops rally and so on and so forth. This is a more commonly used modifier, and we'll see that in the game. He is a two. And finally, the third value, again, just like the combat units, it is a movement value, his movement points. In this case, six. So he basically moves a lot like cavalry. And the same values, same applies to Grant over here, the British, except his values are zero in combat, one for leadership, and six movement. So these are your leadership units. Now we're going to take a look at some of the other counters. Now, the vast majority of these counters are simply reminders. You'll see a lot of these in play during the game session. Uh, this will kind of give you some idea of what they are. But uh, they're basically information reminders. In the case of first fire, plus one DRM, this is placed on rifle units who have yet to fire in the battle. As soon as they fire, this counter will be removed. So this is a nice, friendly reminder that rifle-armed units that fire for the first time have a bonus. And once they get that bonus and fire, this is removed from that counter. Uh, we also have momentum chits. In this case, they're double-sided. You got British on the one side, you got the Colonial on the other side. Momentum is an important part of the game, and we'll get into that when we actually get into the gameplay. But these are little counters to help keep track of momentum, who has it, and how many. Uh, rally on me counters are not often seen, but uh, they are highly useful when you have units in a stack in parade order, and those that are disordered or shattered, uh, when there's a stack, you place this on the top of that stack to remind you that those troops can be rallied. So this is a very useful reminder counter. Uh, of course, here's your disrupted counter, or disorders as I sometimes call it. I believe it's disrupted, uh, which is a morale condition. Uh, worse than this, of course, would be shattered. We'll get into that later as well. But this is a morale modifier, or a reminder, sorry. Next, we have Cavalry Withdrawal, a cavalry unit that uses Cavalry Withdrawal. In other words, it uh, instead of fighting a combat, it has the opportunity to withdraw. It would be marked with this counter to remind you that it used that. Some units are pinned in combat. No results are resolved, but a pin is placed on the combat units. And this is a reminder that those units are pinned. Uh, and other game functions... Uh, such as keeping track of army morale and turn phase, turn sequence. Uh, there's counters for that too, and we'll get into all those details later on in the video. So here's your basic counters. You'll see off and on here and there, in some cases quite often, that's what these are. They are reminders as to uh, various effects in gameplay. Now let's take a look at strength points and stacking. It's Pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, six strength points of infantry or cavalry can occupy the same hex. Uh, in addition, up to one artillery unit or counter can also enter that hex. So in other words, you can have a stack of infantry and cavalry and up to one artillery unit in a single stack. Now in this case here, the British, we have five for the Fraser's Highlanders. And we have a strength point of one for the cavalry. That's a total of six. No more strength points can enter here. Uh, in addition, they can have up to one cannon or artillery counter with them. Uh, that's the maximum artillery units you can combine with infantry and cavalry. Now, the way I play it, uh, I'm not too sure the rules are too clear on this, but it seems as though artillery can be stacked unlimited. Uh, in the same hex. So you can have like six batteries of cannon in the same hex. It doesn't count for stacking purposes. Uh, but when combined with infantry and cavalry, there is a maximum of one artillery unit. Now, I'm not clear about that, about the artillery uh, unlimited stacking in the same hex. That's the way I play it. And to be honest with you, it's probably a big mistake to stack your artillery in the same hex anyway, because uh, you could quite literally lose them all. Uh, with the enemy moving into the hex. So it's it's a little dangerous doing that anyway. So that's the way I play it, and you'll see me do that in the the game plays. However, let's go on to the other counters here. Uh, here we have a hex with six strength points in it. That is all that can be in there. Uh, of course, there could be one artillery in there as well. Uh, down here we have two. 
For the Americans, let's take a look at this stack. We have a leader and also six strength points of militia. So that's the maximum number of infantry and cavalry that can be in that hex right there, just that one. That's six strength points. In addition, an unlimited number of leaders can also stack in a hex. So in this case, there's one leader stacked with this guy. So yeah, and down here we have one strength point in this hex. Uh, these guys could be combined in the same hex because there's three plus one, four. So that is your stacking limits in the game series, six strength points of infantry and cavalry, and up to one artillery unit, or any number of informational counters, leaders, or artillery units. So that's stacking, that's strength points. Now we're going to take a look at the turn sequence, the flow of the game, and you'll see this throughout the actual game plays. Uh, first of all, we start off with an initiative segment, and this is where both sides basically roll a d10 and uh, apply any momentum they might have accumulated during the battle as a modifier uh, to get the upper hand. Highest roll becomes the active side, the side with initiative. He gets to go first, and once that's determined, we go to that player's uh, sequence of play, which is called the initiative player turn. This is where he has his turn. Uh, basically starts off with the movement phase where he moves all his units and his combat units and leaders and counters on the table on the, the map board uh, followed by a rally phase he gets the rally units that are suffering from uh, negative morale effects such as shattered or uh, disordered uh, disrupted rather and that's followed by defensive artillery fire that's where your cannons fire and note it's defensive artillery fire this is actually the opposing player's phase. Only he actually fires during the opponent's turn, the active player's turn. So there is no, uh, when it is your turn, when you're the active player, there is no phase to fire your cannon, per se. Uh, rather, it's the opponent that actually fires on you. So that's an interesting way it works in this game. and It, it reflects the defensive nature of artillery during the era. Uh, so that's what defensive artillery fire represents. It's the opponent's turn to do stuff and fire his cannon, basically. Uh, that's followed by the rifle fire phase. Both players do this, uh, and the results are simultaneous. After that, we resolve close combats. Combat units that are adjacent to one another will fight in this phase. Uh, that's the close combat phase. Once that is done, we move the game turn marker to the bottom half of the game turn and flip it over to reveal the other side uh, is flag. And basically, he's going to be playing next. Uh, I'll show you the turn sequence in a moment, but uh, this is the sequence of play. And once the first player who won initiative completes this, uh, the second player becomes the active side, and he goes through the same sequence. As indicated here, second player turn. Again, he does the same thing. It's a movement phase, rally phase. The opponent gets to shoot with his artillery, uh, followed by rifle fire, which is simultaneous for both sides, and finally close combat. Once he has completed that phase of the turn, we go to the end of turn segment, starting off with checking for automatic victory, uh, See if someone has met the conditions for the scenario and claims victory. Uh, if, it's, if it's the last turn of the scenario, we determine uh, the winner through victory points. Uh, otherwise, uh, if more turns remain, advance the game marker to the next turn on the track. And again, I will show you the turn uh, sequence track. But there you go. That is the sequence of play, a very abbreviated form of it. There's a lot of little things that happen within each area. Of, so for example, the movement phase and the rally phase. There's a lot of little things that happen in there as well. But this is a quick overview of the turn sequence, uh, basically the flow of the game. And again, it's basically movement, rally, defensive artillery fire, rifle fire, close combat, and then move the marker to the next uh, player in that turn. So there you go, folks. That is the sequence of play in the series. 
Now, every game in this series uh, has their own map, of course, and their own map key showing the terrain that's encountered in that particular battle. In this case, we have the Brandywine map. You can see all kinds of different terrain. There's different crop fields, clear terrain, light woods as well as woods. Uh, there's towns and there's paths and there's roads and tracks. There's also hexide terrain, uh, such as runs, which is basically a stream, as well as upslope and downslope. Uh, the whole procedure to moving is pretty straightforward. You basically look for the troop type along the top and cross-reference it with the type of terrain he is moving into, uh, the terrain that's in that hex, as well as the terrain along a hex side, such as slopes, that might also be crossed. And the total is the number of movement points it's going to cost that unit to enter that specific hex. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when you do move a stack, each unit or counter moves independently one at a time. You can't move a whole stack, such as in this case. Uh, it, otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. Now, there's really only two times that you actually carry out shooting, and that's with rifles, which is done simultaneously by both sides, and defensive artillery fire. Uh, both use the same procedure, and it's basically up to two die rolls. The first roll is used on this chart here, ranged two-hit table, the ranged fire two-hit table. Basically, find your target number to hit and cause damage by rolling a d10 and applying any modifiers to it. If you do score a hit with it, you roll a second time on the rifle fire damage table, which is also for the artillery, as you can see at the bottom, artillery fire damage table. And that gives you the actual result. Now, of course, before you can actually do any die rolling and to see if you hit anything, you gotta check range. Artillery basically shoots up to three, uh, and it might have uh, more than one option here as far as targets. Uh, rifles only have a range of one, as indicated here. We've got two rifle units, and they have a multitude of targets here, basically two separate targets for each, and, but they have to be adjacent, so it's adjacent firing. And again, the procedure is very simple. You're only going to refer to these two charts. You roll once to hit, applying some modifiers to your die roll. And if you do score a hit, you roll a second time. There really is no modifiers to this roll, but it is based on the type, if it's a rifle fire or if it's artillery fire. Now, the close combat phase is also pretty straightforward. Uh, the phasing player, the player who's got initiative, will be termed the attacker. Uh, and the opponent will be considered the defender. Basically, it's another d10 roll that the attacker makes, and he modifies uh, that die roll based on the situation for his unit, the attacker, uh, and then the defender's situation as well. As you can see on this chart right here, the close combat DRMs, uh, and that will give you a result. Uh, prior to this, you're going to be comparing strength point as an odds ratio, and you're gonna be referring to this next table, which is called the close combat table, which is right there in the bottom right. And we'll zoom in on that in a second here. There it is. And basically you look up the odds and then you compare it with the die roll, the modified die roll that you attained previously. And that will give you combat results. And for instance, if it's a one-to-one, -one, you might get anything from the attacker uh, takes a loss to a, the opponent is disrupted to the attacker's disrupted and so on. One thing to mention is there is tactics cards and that plays a role in the combat sequence, uh, both sides will pick tactics and which cards they take is based pretty much on if there's generals involved, it might allow them to use certain tactics, but if they're not present, they can't use those tactics. But in general, both sides will choose some tactics and they will compare them and it will end in a result. Uh, that will modify the combat as well. And that's right here on those cards and duplicated on the charts as well. In this case, at the very top, we have tactical matrix. And that's where you compare both uh, tactics chosen by both sides. One thing I should point out is in the actual gameplay sessions that you guys will be watching and following along, uh, some of the things that I do during my game sessions to help remind me of certain things, like especially in combat, is I like to use uh, a red and a blue die to actually show the odds ratio. It's kind of a reminder for me, and it 
be nice and visual for you guys. You'll be able to see it as well. In addition, I like to use little colored rubies, red for negatives and green for positives. So it helps me to remind me of what the modifier totals are to a particular die roll during close combat. So that I hope is helpful for you guys. It's definitely more visual. Uh, and of course, I like to roll the dice right in front of you in my little uh, box, as you can see here. But just a little heads up on how I handle things. Now, one important concept to the system is that of army morale. Uh, the higher, the better is indicated on this track here, which is found on the map. Now, again, this is the Brandywine, which I'm using as an example. Uh, the lowest is red that is demoralized. Your army is defeated. You don't want to get to that level. Above that is wavering. Above that is fatigued. And the best morale you can have for your army is in white, which is high morale. And also shown on here is the starting points for each army. In this case, for Brandywine, both start at 20, uh, as indicated by those little flags. Uh, various things during the battle can cause these army morale levels to drop, as well as rise. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that your army morale does play a role on unit morale, as you can see here, as well as initiative for your side. There are bonuses and penalties involved. Now, if we look at the actual play charts, the victory... Uh, the victory point schedule you can see on the far right there is a category called army morale adjustment uh, various things that can happen that will cause army morale for your side or both sides to go up or down uh, for example, if an enemy unit is captured, uh, the side capturing gets a plus one to its morale. The side getting a unit captured suffers minus one. So there's, it's very intriguing. It's interesting how this works. I really enjoy it, how it affects both sides. One event, one event can affect both sides. That's pretty cool. And so this is an important concept in the game to follow along with and to keep track of. Now, there's a number of ways to actually win a battle, and normally that's indicated in the exclusive rules provided for that particular game or battle that you're playing in the series. Uh, normally, this is determined through victory points, and it usually results in a decisive, substantial, or marginal victory. And there's quite a number of different ways to gain victory points. Uh, in some cases, they're awarded for controlling certain areas on the map, or if you capture or eliminate enemy units, they can grant you uh, victory points as well. Of course, on the play sheets uh, for your particular battle, as you can see here, there is victory point awards for all kinds of things. As you can see down there on the right, there is a listing of various ways to get victory points. Uh, an enemy two-step unit reduced is worth half a victory point. Eliminated, it's worth two, and so on. At the start of every battle, there's usually a pool of five momentum counters, double-sided, red for British, blue for the Patriots. And during the course of the battle, uh, by getting outstanding combat results, and the combat results table will tell you when uh, that occurs, you can gain a momentum chip. And you use these momentum chips throughout the battle, once you gain them, uh, to influence initiative or and or uh, close combats in the future. So they're really useful if you can gain the initiative and maintain it, uh, the momentum. If you have a big advantage in the battle, and this is represented through momentum counters. One more thing I need to mention is the morale state of the units. Uh, as I said earlier, there is a phase called the rally phase where units can be rallied. And normally this is done for any units that are suffering from a shattered or a disrupted condition, as indicated by the counters. As you can see there towards the right, the D and the shattered counters are used to indicate that. Well, there is a way out of that to remove those counters, is simply to rally. And it's a simple die roll. Uh, if a leader is present, it is beneficial uh, to the success of a rally attempt. But otherwise, as long as they are shattered or disrupted, they are, their movement and fighting capabilities are substantially impacted. And as I mentioned earlier, each particular battle within the series does have its own exclusive rules, which go into deployment, orders of battle, special terrain considerations, objectives, victory conditions, and so on. All these will be covered as I go through each of the battles. 
So there you go, folks. That is a rules intro to the Great Battles of the American Revolution series by GMT Games. Uh, again, I will be. I hope that this will supplement my battle vlog as I do some of these battles. I do plan to play Brandywine relatively soon, and you'll be able to watch that turn by turn, dice roll by dice roll. Something I don't usually do, but that's the whole point of the battle vlog series to show you guys everything. Uh, that's basically what makes it a vlog. Uh, so I hope this was useful to you folks. Let me know in the comments. If you have any questions, let me know. Anything about this series or gaming in general, uh, leave me some feedback. So like, share, comment, etc. And remember folks, hang in there. It's only going to get better. Take care.